Uh, well, good morning. I want to welcome you. This is the first time we've ever live streamed a worship service, so thank you for joining us. Uh, there should be some links uh, somewhere on the page for uh, a worship folder uh, that's digital, so you can follow along, uh, as well as if you are joining us online and you've never been to Redeemer uh, for an in-person worship service, uh, we want to welcome you. Uh, glad that you're here with us and uh, worshiping with us. There should be a card or a link to a card, I should say, a connection card. Uh, and if you would be so kind as to fill that out for us uh, and then submit that, uh, we can contact you uh, with information regarding community groups, uh, as well as just other ways to connect to our church. Um, and, and there'll be some other things that we talk about as we go. But welcome. Uh, glad that you are here with us. Uh, so let's worship. I'm going to read the call to worship. Uh, there's a leader in a congregation portion. Uh, and so if you would follow along, this is from Psalm 67 uh, as we begin this morning together. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Amen. Let's see. Uh, 
Clothe yourselves, he says, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Uh, would you pray with me? Prayer of adoration and confession. Uh, and I'll leave room at the end, as we've been doing during the season of Lent, uh, for you to take some, uh, a few moments and silently confess. <clears throat> and then we'll have a corporate confession of sin uh, that we will say together. And you'll be able to follow along with that uh, on the screen uh, as you are worshiping with us. So pray with me. Father, uh, indeed, to you, as we just read, to you alone belongs the dominion forever and ever. Yours is the kingdom and the greatness and the power and the victory and the majesty. All that is in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom because you are exalted as head above all. The earth is yours and all that is in it, all who dwell on it. You are the God of all grace. And because of that, grace flows out of you and through you to us, those you've saved, those you've come to redeem while we were weak, while we were sinners, while we were ungodly. You love to make your enemies into your children. And that fact alone amazes us. And not only should it amaze us, but it should settle us. It should calm and quiet us. We're reminded of the prophet Zephaniah's words, especially in times like these, that you rejoice over us with gladness, that you quiet us by your love. What a good father and a kind king that you are. And we confess, Father, to you this morning how powerless we are. We would say, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you, even as we confess our sins silently. Take a moment uh, and silently confess. So from the Valley of Vision, uh, a, a confession of sin this morning, it's called self-deprecation. Uh, and so we will read these words uh, together. And so I would invite you to follow along. Uh, and as you are uh, worshiping with us, uh, would you say them uh, out loud? Good, good time to confess um, uh, your sin. So let's say these together. Lord, I scarce can open my eyes, but I envy those above me or despise those below? Am I strong and beautiful? What a fuel for pride. Am I weak and needy? What an occasion for sadness. Am I gifted? I lust after applause. Am I unlearned? How I despise what I have not. Am I an authority? How prone to abuse my trust. Make will my laws. Exclude others' desires. And serve my own interests. Am I inferior? How much I begrudge others' preeminence. Am I rich? How exalted I become. Oh God, you know that these are uh, all these are all snares, but my greatest snare is myself. I think too much of myself. I think of myself too much. Turn my gaze instead to you. Amen. Uh, and in light of that. Uh, where we confess our sins, uh, as the scriptures tell us, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let me read these words uh, to you, or over you, I should say, from Zephaniah 3, 14 to 17, some of the most beautiful words in all the scriptures. And as you read them, uh, our prayer is that your soul would begin, as we'll read in a few minutes, your soul really would begin to be calmed uh, and quieted, uh, something we all need desperately. Uh, particularly in this time. So hear these words from Zephaniah. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. 
He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. That's an amen moment. So all God's people said amen. Let's sing.
as we read earlier, we can be restored, we can be confirmed and strengthened and established because you were cast off, you were broken, you were weakened, you were exiled to hell itself. What wondrous love is this? What a wonderful and merciful Savior you are. Thank you that like Naaman, as we read about this week in our community Bible reading, we can't earn our salvation by offering you anything except our trust and faith in your healing power. Thank you for the promise of your presence, that you make yourself present through the Holy Spirit living in us. Oh, how we need the comfort of that promise in these days. Holy Spirit, come and quiet our souls. Calm them with the power of your presence. Humble us with the reality that you are the Lord. There is no other. Nothing escapes your gaze. May we find great comfort in that. And so as we come this morning to intercede, we ask that you would, oh Father, look with favor on the world that you've made. Have mercy. Have mercy in so many ways and as it relates to so many people. We pray this morning, particularly all the nations of the earth, of course, uh, as they have been experiencing the effects of this virus, but we pray particularly for Italy and for China and Iran. We pray for the churches in these countries that you would strengthen brothers and sisters there, that they might be a witness to you, that they might care for the sick and the dying, uh, that they would evidence your kingdom even in the midst of the ravages of this disease. We pray for our own nation, uh, our president, President Trump, and our leaders in Congress, as well as our governor, Governor DeSantis, as they seek to make wise decisions on how best to help millions and millions of people. Father, help us not complain or critique constantly, but to hope and to bear all things out of love, uh, the love that comes from you. We pray for our county, Holt County, and our city, Winter Haven. We pray for local businesses that are impacted uh, by this pandemic. We pray for Legoland and the employees and the leadership there as they've had to close for a number of weeks due to this. We pray for those who especially who are elderly or sick or who live with compromised immune systems already. Would you protect them? And would you help the public services, the public health services, to serve them faithfully and well? And finally, Father, we pray for our own church, Redeemer City. Would you help us, help us use this time to care for one another, to spur one another on in faith and love? We pray that everyone connected to Redeemer would become known in this time as the best neighbors in their respective neighborhoods. As we reach out to our neighbors to care for them as we look in on those who are homebound, uh, as we deliver groceries to those who can't get out, uh, as we connect over Zoom and FaceTime and other means to stay connected uh, and to love one another even in the midst uh, of what is a trying and anxious time. Father, we cast our cares on you, our anxieties on you, our fears on you because you care for us. And so use your word now to reinforce that and make us more like Jesus in the process, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jonathan. So, hey there, everybody. My name is Drew Bennett, one of the pastors here at Redeemer. We're so glad that you could join us for the service. I wanted to say, as we get started, thank you for your flexibility over these past few weeks. Uh, you've been great. I'm so impressed by the resiliency that you've shown. Uh, there, there have been so many great things happening virtually. I really am overwhelmed by it. Uh, there's a pattern in the history of the church uh, where suffering is met with courage by people of faith, which then becomes opportunity, which results in the advance of the gospel. And that's what we're praying that this will be for us as well. The kingdom continues to come. God's will is being done just on Zoom and Facebook and in FaceTime. Uh, as it is in heaven, and I'm rejoicing in that. Uh, if you're new to our church, or if you're new to the idea of church, and you're with us today, I want to say welcome. And we're so glad that you're tuning in with us. We're glad this format of service allows you to join us. And so just so you know kind of what our normal pattern is, in the teaching portion of our services, we usually make our way through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, or in small chunks. And so in February and March of this year, we've been looking at a section of the Psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. The book of Psalms is the hymn book of ancient Israel and of the church today. But these Psalms of Ascent are a collection of songs within that hymn book that the Jewish pilgrims would sing together as they made their way 
up to Jerusalem for the feasts, which God commanded they go to three times a year. And today we come to Psalm 131. And so if you have a Bible there at home uh, and you want to open it, that would be great. Or if you want to look in the worship folder we've provided for you, or I think just over my shoulder on the screen behind me, uh, we'll be able to read these words together. Psalm 131. It's very short, only three verses. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. This is God's word. Charles Spurgeon said Psalm 131 is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. And to get right to the point, the psalmist says here, look there, I've calmed and quieted my soul. And that is what we're after. It's what we need. It's why I think uh, God's providence has been so good to us, too. We didn't plan for this. We were just going to be here in this psalm. It's what the world needs for people of faith to be so composed and reasonable and full of courage in the midst of the storm like the one we're facing as a society today. Uh, Jeremiah Burroughs, who was a famous Puritan preacher in the 16th century, uh, during a, an outbreak of plague that rocked England, he preached a series of sermons that became very, very famous uh, and became a book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, which is probably one of my top five books that I've ever read. It would be a great time to buy that. Amazon would probably appreciate the business and, uh, and read that. What a great opportunity for us to do as well. But he preached that series of sermons to his people in the midst of such great pain and loss because he knew that the real storm wasn't the disease. It was their unbelief. It was their internal frame as they faced the storm, the way they so easily became disquieted by their suffering, which then obviously in their lives became all kinds of off things like fretting and complaining and selfishness and so forth. What we need more than a change of circumstances, what we need is a change of our inner frame to be like the psalmist says here, to be calmed and quieted in our soul. And we're going to see three things just about that phrase uh, from this psalm this morning. Why we indeed need it, why we need a work like this to happen in us. Secondly, the obstacles or, or what has to happen in your life for that change to happen. And ultimately, thirdly, where the power to live, as the psalmist talks about here, uh, truly comes, comes from. So let's just ask a number of questions of this text as we go through it together. And the first, I think, would be, what exactly, what is this? Why do we need this? What is it that the psalm means when it talks about a calm and quiet soul? Look there again in verse 2, I have calmed and quieted my soul. And the, refra the phrase there refers to an inner repose that is unaffected by external circumstances. The Apostle Paul put it this way when he wrote to the Philippian Christians. He says, I have learned in whatever circumstance that I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then the famous verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We, we know. Life is a roller coaster, up and down, up and down constantly. And the tendency is for your insides to go up and down with it. When things are up, you're up. When things are down, you're down. And that's natural. And things are down right now. This is a time of want, not plenty. And so it's natural to be down. Our, our inner lives naturally track with our external circumstances. But Paul says here in Christianity, there's a supernatural power to go through all of the ups and downs. God doesn't promise any other reality except that life would be just like but that. But there is a supernatural power to go through all of the ups and downs that life brings and not emotionally, inwardly get on the roller coaster ride. The word Paul uses there in Philippians chapter 4 to describe it is contentment or to be content. He says, no matter what, I'm content. I'm full. I'm satisfied. I'm at ease. Probably the, the most familiar synonym in the Bibles 
for this condition is the word peace. And so earlier in that passage, he says this. He says, rejoice. Don't, don't be anxious. Give thanks to God and let God know what you need. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now notice the imagery there. It's a famous verse, Philippians 4, 7. It says that peace is like the National Guard. It's a fortress, a castle. So when you've inwardly got peace, it puts up protective walls in the inner parts of your life. And the threat on the outside that's trying to get in can't get in. And so no matter how bad it might be out there, in here, you're safe. In here, you're okay. There's no change. The storm might be raging out there, but it's quiet in here. And we're facing a time where the storm, the winds and the waves, they're raging. And what we need and what our world needs most is for us to be people in the midst of that kind of change, in the midst of that kind of anxiety, to be people who have calm and quiet hearts. So the next question then would be, obviously, well, then how, if we need that kind of inward life, well, how can you get an inward life like that? And here the answer is surprising. At least it was for me as I studied this psalm uh, this week. What the psalmist says to us here is that you need... In order to get an inward life like that, you need to cultivate a life of humility. And I use the word cultivate on purpose because notice the language. In Zephaniah 3, which Jonathan read a little while ago for us, it says that God quiets us with his love. Now, we're going to get to that in just a minute. But here, look, the psalmist is taking himself in hand, as Martin Lewis jones would say. He's proactively doing soul maintenance. He's the one going to work on his own heart. He says, notice he is the, the, the one doing all the acting. I, I, I have calmed and quieted my soul through this process of cultivating a life of humility. Now, there are two things specifically that he's seeking to prune away from his life. And the first is what you see there in verse 1. It's unruly, sinful ambition. There's good ambition and there's sinful, unruly ambition. And, and this is the latter. Look there. He says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Now, we learn a lot about the way ambition works. Prideful, sinful ambition from those lines. The heart goes first, it says. It becomes lifted up with a desire for glory and fame so as to be exalted above everyone else. And then the eyes come next. The eyes get involved. They set themselves on some lofty goal, some end of the road that they stare down until uh, you can get there. And then something more, something better, something bigger, something beyond what I have right now. And then the hand reaches out to grasp and take hold of it. And if the psalmist is to be believed, a life of achieving and grasping and winning is the opposite of a calm and quiet soul. It results most often in restlessness. St. Augustine talked about this quite a bit. He said, that in his experience, you can win. You can get to the top. You can accomplish all your goals and dreams and still feel just as empty and anxious as you were before. Actually, when you reach the goal and it doesn't change anything, it doesn't make you feel any different, you feel disappointment instead of exhilaration. It actually increases the anxiety. You reach the finish line, and you realize it's just the start of the next competition. And that's the problem. But you see, the opposite of this unruly ambition is not humility. It is sloth, one of the seven deadly sins. And sloth is the sin of not caring. It's apathy, boredom. Jamie Smith writes, he says, We sometimes like to comfort ourselves by imagining that the ambitious are prideful and arrogant so that those of us who never risk, who never aspire, never launch out into the deep, get to wear the moralizing mantle of humility. <laughs> but this imagining is often just a thin cover for a lack of courage, even laziness. Plain and safe isn't humble. And this is the second thing the psalmist was seeking to prune away from his life. It's a symptom of not growing up, not cutting the apron strings, as Eugene Peterson put it in his book on these psalms, but there, verse 2, I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. That is, 
A child who is growing up, who's maturing, who's already leaving her mother behind and venturing out on her own. So it's one thing to think too much of yourself and to occupy yourself with things too great for you. That is one danger. It's just as spiritually dangerous to think too little of yourself and to occupy yourself with things too small for one made in the image of God, made to rule, made to have dominion in his name. So ambition and sloth are both deadly sins. Humility is the golden mean. A humble person doesn't take themselves so seriously. They can enjoy the small things in life. The things that our lives these days are now full of, like a sunset, or a walk in the neighborhood, or a family dinner, or the pleasure of a hobby. But you see, a humble person also isn't afraid to risk. They're not afraid of the big demands, the big dreams, the big things. They don't think too much of themselves. They don't think of themselves too much. So, how then do you become a person like that? And that's really the last question we have to ask of these verses. If, if an anxious heart, if the way you, you go after an anxious heart, the calm and quiet, it is to cultivate a life of humility, then how do you become a person who exhibits, who's, whose life really does take the character of the one being described here? And you've got to go a little deeper into the image of the child with its mother here, okay? So in verse 2, we've got to dive down into those those words, that image there a little bit more. It says, I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Well, what is it about a weaned child? Well, when a baby who is still nursing climbs up in to her mother's lap, she's there for a very clear purpose. She's there because there's something she wants from mom. She's on the take. She's demanding to get. But when a child has been weaned and that child climbs up into mom's lap, she's there for only one reason. She's there because of love. And that's the transition that has to take place in all of our lives. You see, a spiritually mature, excuse me, a spiritually immature person relates to God because he's useful. He uses God to get from him the things he really wants. He doesn't want God. He wants God's gifts. And people who operate in this mindset, either consciously or subconsciously, fall into performance-based religion. And it goes something like this. If I want God's gifts, a good life, health, career success, everything to go well with the kids, whatever it might be. If I want those things, then I've got to do what he says. I've got to be good because, because we all know God is good to good people and he's bad to bad people. And I, I have to earn his favor. I've got to earn that generosity from him. And that is performance-based religion. And it's the way most people think about God. It's the why beneath so much of our ambition. We don't even know it. We're busy achieving. We have all kinds of reasons, but the real reason is because we just want God to look at us and say, well done. And it's the why beneath our sloth, too. It's easier to not care and to just not do anything, not dare anything, not risk anything than it is to fail and have God disapprove of us. Again, you might not even feel it. But what the Bible says very clearly is that your emotional life is lived toward God like that because you were made for him. And you'll be restless and you'll be anxious as long as that relationship isn't right. And so Eugene Peterson has this great line. He says this. He says, our lives are lived well only when they're lived on the terms of their creation. Let me say it again. Our lives are lived well only when they're lived on the terms of their creation, with God loving us and being loved, with God making and us being made. The spiritually immature person uses God. There's no love. It's just a business transaction. But there's only one thing that can calm and quiet your soul. And it's to have, and there's only one thing that can really cultivate a life of humility, and it's to have a relationship with God like the relationship between a weaned child and her mother. Verse 2 like a weaned child is my soul within me. And the weaned child, she isn't thinking about what she can get from mom. She's just enjoying 
being wrapped up in mom's arms. Your soul will never be right. You will never know the calmness and the quietness the psalmist talks about here until you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that you know, above all things, you know with absolute certainty both that God loves you and also that it's all grace. And let me just finish with that. Just those two thoughts as we close. I adore, I absolutely adore the Zephaniah passage we read, which says that God rejoices over us with singing. Isn't that an amazing thought? He will quiet you by his love, it says there in Zephaniah 3, 17. It's just, it's just so beautiful. It's almost, it's almost just too hard to comprehend. And it's the very similar language to Psalm 131 here, but it shows the way God's love does this rather than the way we work on our own hearts. He sings over us a love song that when we truly internalize it can make our hearts calm and quiet. Uh, when my girls were much younger, I have two girls, uh, I would sing them a lullaby from an Andrew Peterson album. Uh, and the chorus of the song, and I would sing it to them every night as they went to bed. And the chorus, I won't sing it to you, but I'll just say the words. The words are, beautiful girls, our beautiful girl, daddy loves you. He loves you, most beautiful girl in the whole wide world. And every night, uh, every night we'd sing this song, and I would sing it as they, they were falling asleep. And then I remember the day, it had been many years ago now, uh, we were around the house, and Sarah, who's my youngest, was doing the chores that we'd given her to do, and she was in her room, and I could hear her singing at the top of her lungs from her room, beautiful girl, daddy loves you, over and over and over again. It was just the best. Mm-hmm. That the love song that I had been singing over her night after night had sat on her soul. And she knew she was loved. Do you know that God loves you like that? Does God's love song sit on your soul like that? A song he sings over you in love? If so, you'll be able, like the psalmist, to avoid unhealthy ambition. You won't have anything to prove. But also to avoid sloth. You don't have anything to fear. Anything to be afraid of. And instead calm and quiet your soul. But there's a second question. Do you know that God loves you like that? But here's the other question. Do you know how it is that God loves you? How it is he can love you like that? Do you know that his love is all grace? That is, that it's not dependent upon your performance at all, good or bad. See, Christianity is not religion. It is gospel. It's not advice. It is news. And the good news is, that I get to share with all of you week after week, but again this morning, is this. Jesus Christ, God himself, has come to earth to live the life that you should have lived and to die the death that you deserve to die. He lived before God as you. He died on the cross, a substitute for sinners as you, for your sins, so that now God loves you as him. Humility is self-forgetfulness at the end of the day. It's not thinking about yourself. It's not thinking about you so much. Well, do you know that God in his love for you isn't thinking about you? Think about that. That God, as he's loving you, he's not thinking about you either. He's not impressed with your successes. He's not frustrated with your failures The Bible says this, he loves you and I for one reason. He loves us for Jesus' sake. So, you don't have to be achieving. You can't improve on what Jesus has done for you. And you don't have to be afraid of failure. If your soul is resting in Christ, the verdict is in. God has already decided and your performance does not earn you God's love, so it cannot forfeit it. It's all grace. This is what Christians believe. And so... Take a deep breath. You want to do that with me? Let's take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. It doesn't all depend upon you. Calm and quiet your soul with the truth that that God loves you and that it's all grace. Now, what does this have to do with our current situation? With what we're facing? Well, as you might know, there are sure to be many highs and many lows in the days to come. It's a roller coaster ride. It's felt like that for me, but here, but here's the thing. We don't have to get on the emotional roller coaster. Here's my advice to you, and here's what I think this psalm is ultimately telling us to do. Take yourself in hand. 
Take yourself in hand like the psalmist here. Do whatever you have to do. Get yourself in the word. Watch these services. Take yourself in hand. Don't wait for God to quiet you. Calm and quiet yourself by reminding yourself of the truth. That whatever is in store, God hasn't abandoned us. We're not being punished. We're not, we're, we're not being, you know, slapped on the wrist. What this says is we're being weaned. And the moms have advantages over the dads here because they know firsthand the fussiness that goes with trying to wean a child. God is weaning us to mature our faith. He's weaning us from our addiction to comfort. He's weaning us from our reliance on positive gains in the stock market for joy. He's weaning us from the toxic unreality that we're in control of our lives. And it's a good work for him to do because the end of it is more faith, more joy, more peace. And those are the things that we need the most. Those are the things that will allow you and I to live with the kind of inward repose and courage that could yet again turn the world upside down. So, friends, listen, here is God's word to you this morning, and it's just how the psalm ends. Hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Amen? Let's pray. Would you pray with me? So, Father, thank you for these few minutes that we've had to be together this morning. Thank you for how faithfully you have loved us through these dark days. Thank you that you will prove yourself, we know, to be faithful tomorrow and the day after and the day after. We have every reason to believe you. So we do not need to take our hands and put them on our lives and work things out the way we think we need for them to be, but we can receive from you. We don't need to sit around and afraid to do anything for fear of making a mistake, but we can risk and be bold and courageous. Help us to cultivate lives of humility and to calm and quiet our souls before you so that those who don't know you would see in us something that would cause them to ask questions so that you might be glorified in us so that we might find the joy and peace and the hope and the meaning that we're meant to have as you wean us in this time, would you continue to do this good work in us and give us gracious hearts to receive it as a good work from your hand. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond as we sing a uh, dear refuge of my weary soul.
So hold on to these words. Uh, view your circumstances through what God says here. Don't view God through what your circumstances bring. So receive these words of benediction. All of those whose faith is in the Lord Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. We're praying for you. Uh, go in his peace. <laughs>